Okay, uh, welcome. Thank you for coming and taking interest in, in this particular topic. Uh, before I start, uh, all the orange stuff are uh, hyperlinks. So, uh, given given that I given that I have I, that I have only 20 minutes time, I won't be able to go into into any kind of detail. But you can get the, this uh, presentation, and if you want to explore uh, anything of interest, click on the links, and it will take you there. Um, so. This is the structure of the talk. Uh, I, I would like to define, uh, so I'll, I'll be talking about, uh, talking about elasticity. I, will, I would like to define uh, briefly what I mean. So I don't mean uh, somebody doing gymnastics and being elastic, that's for sure. And then I'll um, basically have a look at what is available uh, with regards to elasticity in OpenStack today. And then give you a bit of an outlook where things are going. Okay, elasticity. Uh, so do I, have a, do I have a pointer? Somewhere? No. Okay, so what you see here is uh, the classic, uh, classic explanation of, um, of elasticity in the cloud. So the, the red curve is the actual load. So as you can see, it varies quite a bit. And what you want to have is the green curve behavior. So uh, what you want is you want your uh, capacity to be elastic. So as your load increases, uh, you want your capacity to increase as well to sustain it. Thank you. And uh, uh, when the load decreases, like here, let's say this is a weekend, uh, you also want your, your capacity, to, capacity to go down. You want to turn off uh, machines, and this is good for your uh, electricity bill, for the good of the world, etc. And so this is like classic, so this blue curve, this is like how, how we used or how to build data centers, or how uh, many organizations even build data centers today. So basically, you, you start with an estimated capacity, and it's a bit of a lose lose proposition. So what I mean by that is, so he, here you see that the capacity you've built and provisioned is much higher than it needs to be. So this is uh, opportunity cost. You're losing money because you you basically sunk more money into a data center than you needed to do in the first place. This is the other uh, kind of variety of losing. Uh, so the, the actual load is exceeding your capacity. So here you have unhappy customers and you're losing like money or customers that way. And again, like the, this green curve, which is your elastic capacity, this is sort of the holy grail of IT. This is what people want to have. And this is why um, cloud is so interesting. So, and so, uh, so any, any kind of cloud gives you uh, elastic capacity, okay? But what I'll be talking about here specifically is automated scaling. So not, not like a human being watching uh, the load and then basically uh, spinning up uh, and down instances, but uh, uh, all of this in an automated fashion. Okay, so before we start uh, on auto scaling, I just want to show you a couple of things. So the first question uh, you need to ask yourself is, uh, I mean, or this automated, this automated scaling behavior has a cost as well. It has, a, it has the cost of complexity. So I want to point out this survey, survey that uh, uh, the Cloud Checkers company did with AWS customers. So they took like uh, 1,000 uh, Amazon Cloud customers and did a survey of how they use the Amazon Cloud and what they're doing there. And what they found is that uh, almost two-thirds of the customers had auto-scaling exceptions. So they use auto scaling, okay, but uh, almost two thirds of them had uh, auto scaling configuration errors. Okay, so uh, the images were misconfigured. So they were trying to use uh, images that didn't exist or were wrong in some other way. Uh, security groups uh, or uh, SSH key pairs. Okay, so bear in mind that these are sort of obvious uh, mistakes. So you basically just did, a, did something wrong in your configuration. Okay, and I won't even talk about people who didn't have obvious configuration mistakes, but uh, uh, whose auto-scaling configuration like, wasn't good in some other way. So uh, when they were slammed with load, the, the auto-scaling was too slow or too slow to react, or they didn't like, scale up uh, uh, enough. So what, what I'm trying to say here is, yes, auto-scaling is good, think, but think first, do you need it? And if you do think you need it, make sure that your auto-scaling config is good and make sure you test it, okay? Make sure it works. Okay, so this is, uh, this is the do you really need it uh, uh, side of the coin. You ain't gonna need it. So, and so the first thing to understand is the workload, okay? What kind of workload do we have? 
Again, complexity is a killer. If you can uh, avoid auto scaling, then do avoid it. I mean, there's no reason to, to deploy something if you don't need it. Okay. So here's, here's two examples of, uh, of workloads, which are sort of uh, pretty regular. So here, uh, this is like a weekend uh, workload, okay? So online ticketing, people who, who, who buy tickets for cinemas or concerts. So this, this website is slammed on, on Saturday and, and Sunday. But like during the week, uh, working week, it's sort of pretty much dead. Okay, so, and if you, if you like observe such a workload uh, over a longer period of time, well, you know, just make it work. Make sure you, you have enough capacity over the weekend. Likewise here, this is some kind of travel insurance thingy, okay? So you see here, uh, like early in the year, so there's a lot of, uh, lot of load, but then like uh, during the rest of the year, it's sort of almost static. So again, try, uh, try to avoid complexity and only use things if you need them. Okay, so this is the uh, auto scaling menagerie. Uh, these are the kind of things you have there. Okay, uh, so the way this works uh, is you, you measure. So you monitor and measure your system. So you, you define certain metrics. So one metric could be CPU load, uh, or average CPU load uh, on, on, a, on an instance uh, in an auto scaling group. So you could say, okay, we have some kind of uh, kitten photograph scaling service. So we are like CPU intensive. So if, if the load exceeds 70%, I want to scale up. I want to uh, add capacity. Okay. Another thing you could, you could uh, measure is like average request response time, et cetera, et cetera. So what you, do to, what you, what you need to do in any case is you, you, you need to define a threshold. Uh, a threshold for scaling up. So basically you, you need to draw a line in the sand and say, okay, if, if this metric exceeds this threshold, I know I have a problem, okay? And that, uh, if the threshold is crossed upward, uh, an alarm will be uh, issued, and that alarm can be connected or associated with a policy, and the policy will then specify what needs, what kind of auto scaling action you want to trigger and what needs done. So the policy usually is, uh, has a launch configuration, because if you need to spin up virtual instances, you need to specify the image, uh, the instance type, etc. And so all of this is in the launch configuration. And it typically also specif specifies the adjustment type. So you can adjust, like, you can say, I want to double uh, the size of my fleet, or I want to add 10 instances, or I want to, to add 25% of my fleet, etc. And then the change, change in capacity, which can be positive if you want to increase capacity, or negative if you want to, to turn off resources. So the example here is uh, like the sc scaling up thing. So you see here you have, an, uh, you have a load balancer and an auto scaling group and uh, servers in your auto scaling group. And this is the scale out thingy. So basically your load is increasing and you need more capacity. So you just double the size of, of this uh, auto scaling group. Okay, so let's look, at, let's look at the status quo. Like, if you are deploying an OpenStack cloud or using an OpenStack cloud, like, how can you, uh, you auto-scale today? Okay. Okay, so the first possibility is do it yourself. Uh, so you, you either write all of this yourself or in part. Okay. Uh, so I sort of go and um, talk to a lot of people. I go to, like, DevOps days, and I'm surprised by the number of companies who are actually doing this. Okay. So... Particularly, particularly like tech savvy startups uh, who deploy non trivial systems in the cloud, they basically have, the, uh, have their own uh, operation layer in the cloud. Even, they deploy, even if they deploy in Amazon and uh, they have all of this stuff, uh, they write their own stuff. Oftentimes this is triggered uh, by the sense that CloudWatch or the equivalent monitoring systems in public clouds are just too crude, not really good enough for what they need. So they deploy like more sophisticated monitoring software like Sensor or Riemann and then basically uh, take it from there. They're also concerned with lock-in and portability. They say, okay, uh, yes, we are in this public cloud, it's Amazon's, it's rack spaces, but we don't to be, uh, in, in order to avoid lock-in, in order to be able to sort of change to another cloud, we, we want to have a we want to have our own operation layer, and it is fairly portable. Okay, the second choice today in, uh, in OpenStack is heat. Uh, but if, if you want to use heat, you need to, do, you need to run your own OpenStack cloud because no uh, public cloud provider, no public OpenStack cloud provider offers heat today. So Rackspace offers uh, a beta auto-scaling service. 
which is uh, which has which has been open sourced only like three four days ago, and which which will which will go into heat, which will become uh, which will replace uh, the auto scaling component we have in in heat right now. And the other thing you can do is uh, if you think that multi provider is the future, so you want to straddle like two clouds, you want to deploy in Amazon's cloud and in something like HP or Rackspace, you can go uh, and sign up with, with a company like RightScale, which will basically then take care of your automatic scaling for you. Okay, and Heat being uh, sort of the only, um, the only, ch the only game in, in town uh, in, uh, in OpenStack, I, I just want to sort of take a, show you a bit more about that. Okay, so what is it? It's an uh, it's it's sort of it's a fairly new component in OpenStack. It it passed incubation in the last the open cycle and is being integrated now in Havana. It uh, started off by implementing in the cloud formation uh, template format uh, of Amazon's on OpenStack. Who has used uh, cloud formation or knows about cloud formation? Okay, a couple of people. Okay, so uh, what is CloudFormation? So CloudFormation is sort of uh, a way to, to specify what an entire system in a cloud looks like. So if you use something like Amazon or Rackspace or HP, we typically operate on resources, like I want, I want a virtual instance, I want this uh, storage block, et cetera, et cetera. So what CloudFormation or Heat allow you to do is to say, okay, well, here's a template, here's a file, and it actually specifies what my, what my entire system looks like. And so it will enumerate all the cloud resources you need and how they relate to each other. Okay, so here's the diagram. So what you do is uh, you basically write your template. Okay, you obviously first need to figure out your architecture. If you don't, if you don't have that, I mean, there's nothing to do. Okay, once, once you have figured out what, what, what kind of architecture you have or want to have, you write a template. Okay, and that, that template is passed to a service. So in Amazon Cloud, it's cloud formation. In the OpenStack Cloud, it's heat. It looks at the template and says, ah, okay, he wants this resource and this resource. He wants an auto scaling group, a load balancer, this many uh, instances. And then that service will materialize this entire setup. will bring up all the resources, associate them uh, as, as needed, and basically uh, bring the system to stand up. So why is this interesting? Well, the templates are text. So all the sort of all the best practices that apply to any kind of uh, code artifact apply here as well. So you can re you can revision control them. Okay, they can be shared. Like if you have like a multiple uh, operations people, uh, you know, if one is uh, on, a, on a vacation or whatever, uh, you can talk to him. You can look at a template. You can read. You can see. Uh, so it's shared knowledge, and uh, this can be combined with Puppet and Chef. So basically, what you can do is you can say, yeah. I want, I want an auto scaling group. I want uh, four instances to start with. And then you can specify uh, that these instances should be using Puppet, for example. And as, once they come up, they will connect and get, get themselves co configured. So basically, it's, it's, a good, it's a good way to go about. OK, I don't think I will have time to look at uh, templates, so I'll just skip this. OK, so let's, uh, let's have a look at uh, what heat looks, looks like at present. OK, so, so the heat project was pursued by a team uh, from Red Hat. And what they did is really uh, they, they sort of hunkered down and they implemented, they did a huge deal of work and they implemented all of CloudFormation except, except for the uh, resources that we don't have in OpenStack right now. For example, we don't, right now we don't have a DNS as a service in OpenStack. So they didn't implement that, okay. But uh, so whatever, could, could, whatever could be mapped, whatever was available in OpenStack Cloud, they implemented. So uh, auto scaling, the monitoring piece, load balancing and orchestration. And uh, this was like a good first step to get momentum and to get an orchestration system uh, into, into OpenStack. But like, this is not a good way to uh, build systems uh, like uh, mid or long term because this is too much. Okay, so each of these pieces is like a service in its own right. Okay, so uh, once once they got into OpenStack, uh, there was there was this realization: Hey, wait a minute, you know, you did this cool, good software, but this is too much on one heap. We, we need to decouple this. We need to break out things and uh, factor out things. 
Okay, so this is the, this then is the future. So uh, uh, at, at the last OpenStack summit in Portland, uh, there was a lot of discussion between the Heat uh, developers and Rackspace. So Rackspace said, "Look, we have an auto scaling service uh, which is sort of ready, and we'll open source it, and we'll make we'll replace Heat's auto scaling by, with this. It's called Otter." And uh, when it comes to monitoring, there's Solometer, uh, which is another service which, 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 is, which is just doing metering and monitoring. So it makes no sense for heat to maintain its own monitoring code. Likewise for uh, uh, load balancing. Uh, so heat implemented load balancing uh, using a virtual machine uh, and, uh, that runs HA proxy. Okay. But the quantum uh, project, which we are not allowed to, to call quantum anymore, the networking project uh, is implementing a load balancing as a service. So once that gets ready, uh, Heat will uh, use that. So, uh, so what you can see here is that Heat that started uh, as all of this, as a collection of all of these components, okay, they'll sort of shed, shed weight, shed, shed complexity, and become just the orchestration framework, which is the right way to go about things. Okay, more future plans, resources and providers. So, as I said, uh, what Heat allows you to do is to specify the cloud resources you need to consume and to connect them, to wire them up. Okay. So the question then is, if you go into some of this public cloud and you say, okay, I want to have this database as a service. Okay. Uh, uh, one way to satisfy this resource is for, to, is for somebody to, to uh, define what does database as a service look in this cloud. And so typically, your public cloud provider will have its own default implementation of the database as a service resource. Okay. But let's say they provide MySQL, and for some reason, uh, you don't like MySQL. Okay. So what would be nice is if you could say, okay, I don't want to use uh, the, the cloud provider's default resource definition. I want, I want my own uh, provider. I want, I want my own component for this cloud resource I, because I want to use Postgres. So when I say database as a service in my template, okay, don't take uh, the default provider, uh, but take mine, which is sort of cool because uh, not only can you then specify what your system looks like, but you can also plug in your own providers for certain cloud resources. The other thing is, uh, from an architectural perspective, all services in OpenStack uh, consist of an API and then have backends which satis satisfy this, uh, this uh, API. And heat just needs to be refactored to basically adopt the same architectural uh, pattern. Native templates, uh, many people sort of get, uh, get goosebumps when they read AWS template codes because all the resources are named inside an AWS uh, namespace. So there is work uh, to define uh, an OpenStack heat native template format, which avoids all the AWS uh, resource names. And last but not least, multi-cloud support. So uh, it is well possible, uh, so I know people who are doing this experimentally, to deploy heat outside of two OpenStack clouds and then basically uh, operate uh, across multiple clouds. So, and all of this is coming. So in summary, so it's early days for auto scaling. So uh, basically your only option at this point is heat. You, uh, you need to have your own OpenStack cloud, deploy heat and use it for auto scaling. Okay. Uh, or you can use your own tooling or cloud operations. That's it. <laughs>